friends! Welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. Today's episode, Newbie Tuesdays, we are going to build a desktop app with Electron. And uh, I think they can hear you now, Tony. Say hello. Hello, hello. Hello! <laughs> cool. Uh, if you're having trouble hearing Tony, let me know. We'll, we'll adjust the levels. Uh, but yes, we are going to build a desktop app today. And the idea is it's going to be a clipboard history manager. So essentially, every time you copy something on your computer, it's going to keep track of that. So that later on, let's say later on, you go to paste something, but you accidentally copied something else. This app will keep track of everything you've copied. So you can actually like go back in time. How does that sound, Tony? Tony? Sounds awesome. OK, cool. <laughs> uh, have you heard of apps like this or seen apps like this before? Um, I remember I was listening to a podcast a while back with uh, Wes Boss and the, um, the other guy. Um, and he, uh, one of them was talking about this sort of thing for like getting pictures. Like you just save them to your clipboard. Oh, interesting. I actually have that as a, a stretch feature. But uh, James, welcome to the stream. Scott, welcome to the stream. It's going to be fun. So today we are going to talk about uh, what is Electron, and uh, then we will build an app with Electron. And the idea is we're going to have like a, a tray icon. So I don't know, this is like some other app I have installed, but the app that we install or create will have an icon up here where you can click on it, and then you'll see a list of all of the things that you have copied since you had the app open. And then you'll be able to click on any one of them. That'll put it on your clipboard, and then you can paste it somewhere. Uh, this is also really good if you're working with like code snippets. So like you could like copy several things from Stack Overflow, and then when you get back to your editor, open up the menu, and uh, choose something from your from your clipboard. Uh, we are going to use Bulma for styling, and we're going to have a super basic Vue.js app. It's going to be super basic. Um, any questions, thoughts, comments before we get started, Tony? Um, I don't think so. I'll probably ask him as a. Uh... <laughs> As we go along, I, I guess um, basically, like my understanding is that it's almost like a a browser that's going to be running, but isn't actually online. It technically is online, but yes, when uh, right now this very first bullet point, we're going to talk about what actually is happening with Electron. Cool. Okay. Uh, James said he paid for an app like this a year ago. <laughs> we're going to make it for free and open source, and you can add pull requests. Um, uh, Emmy, hello, welcome to the stream. Amal, welcome back. Yes, all right. So first, what is Electron? Uh, you can check out their site at electronjs.org. Uh, their tagline is build cross-platform desktop apps with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So the, the idea is your app is actually running inside of the Chromium browser. So Chromium, let's look that up is the open source implementation, underlying implementation of Google Chrome. And so this is like the actual browser engine. And then Google Chrome adds some proprietary stuff on top of it. But the underlying core actually is open source. So an Electron app is running essentially like a Chrome browser. But it has access to no a node environment and like all the modules on NPM as well. So. You may not be familiar with these limitations, but when you're building an app inside of the web browser, you cannot access the user's file system unless you explicitly ask them for access. And even then, it's still limited. Um, you can't use node modules that like access the native device features inside of the browser. And the Electron project essentially gives you a Chromium browser that's also running Node and allows you to access all of these different packages from NPM inside of it while still being able to build websites like you're used to. So we could actually build a Vue.js app. We could use Bootstrap. Today, we're going to use Bulma. But basically, we have a web page running inside of this Chromium thing, but it has access to Node and Node modules and the native uh, environment. Were you going to say something, Tony? Uh, no. No. <laughs> um, yeah, and they're they're, what they're saying here is if you can build a website, you can build a desktop app. Uh, Electron is a framework for creating native applications with web, with web technologies like JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. And the idea is uh, because you're using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and because it's running in this Chromium browser, because Chromium is supported on all these different platforms, uh, Linux, Windows, Mac, and Node is supported on all these platforms, you build your app, and then you're able to distribute it and bundle it so that it can work on any operating system, which is pretty cool. 
Um, and just to talk about like some really popular apps that are using Electron, uh, VS Code is using Electron. Let me see if I can, can I bring up the dev tools? No, I know, that, I know that I can do that inside of Atom, but this is literally a Chromium browser, and all of these things that we're looking at right now are like HTML elements inside of VS Code. Um, GitHub Desktop, Hyper Terminal, uh, Slack, Discord, Atom, VS Code, all of these things were built with Electron. Julian, welcome to the stream, hello. Um, does that kind of like clear up the, qu the initial question or thought that you had at the beginning? Yeah, I, yeah, I think that uh, I think I kind of get a rough grasp of how it works. Cool, and uh, you you will see as we build it. You'll, you'll yeah, it'll it'll make a little bit more sense. But the main idea is like you could literally build a website. It's running inside of this thing, but it has access to uh, the native device that it's running on as well. Cool. So that is what Electron is. Let's get started, Tony. So if we take a look at their uh, website. They do have this GitHub repo that we can clone down to do a quick start. So we are going to clone that. And, oh, and we're calling our app Clipboard Elephant because an elephant never forgets. Huh? Bom, bom, bom. <laughs> cool. So I cloned that down. This is like just a basic Electron app uh, ready to go from them. We're going to go inside of it. Uh, there's a few different things in here. We'll do an npm install. Uh, Amal is saying, is one clipboard what we're building? I've never heard of it, but sounds like it. <laughs> uh, but we're, we aren't going to do any sort of, we're not going to be like storing it in a database or anything like that. But it is going to be keeping track of everything that you copy. Because typically, like, if I were to copy this and then copy something else, I, lo I lose the previous copy. And the idea is we're going to keep track of every single thing that you copy so that you can click on anything. But, Leia, let's check out this one clipboard while our NPM modules are installing. And let's take a, a quick break. And a question from James. Uh, an Electron app requires a download to the hard drive. Yes. So you can't just run an Electron app inside of a browser you uh, package it and then for someone to use your app, they have to actually download the DMG or the EXE uh, or whatever gets created for, for Linux to be able to actually run your app. So similar to how you uh, had to install VS Code or how you had to install Atom, that is how you would be, uh, use our Electron app once we package it. Oh, so uh, Mala is saying one, one clipboard was actually on the list of Electron projects. Oh, there it is, cool. But yeah, we're going to build like a super basic version of this. Basically, it's going to show you a history of all the things you copied, and then you can click on them. Very cool. Uh, OK, so we cloned that down. We npm installed it. Now if we do an npm start, we are going to get a basic Electron app. There we go. And notice, this is not running inside of the browser. This is a totally separate app. It has its own controls. It has its own menu up here. And you'll notice that it's telling you what version of Node it's using, what version of Chromium, and this is its own desktop application. If you were to run this, do we uh, still get Dev Tools in here? Yeah, check this out. So you, uh, there's some actually some some code code that we can write to enable the Dev Tools when we're in development. But yes, so actually we can uh, toggle them as or uh, dock them as well. But yes, you get access to element selector and console and all that good stuff right inside of here. So what you're what you're looking at right now is literally a Chromium view. And then they've done some special things to give you access to Node and stuff like that. Uh, but in, in a cool thing to note is because I'm running on Mac right now, that's why these, like the toolbar looks like this and the, the window buttons look like that. But if we were to run this on Windows, it would look like a native Windows app. Cool, let's take a look at the code. So that created this directory. And there are a few different things going on in here. Main.js is kind of like the uh, the entry point. Um, I'm gonna do my ESLint thing just so it won't complain. But uh, one of the main things with creating Electron app is creating windows. And so they have this built-in thing called a browser window and that is what actually opens up window and that's, that's what we saw when we first launched the app. And then it tells it to load a file. So all of our HTML is going to go inside of this index.html. 
And then any JavaScript code we write to interact with that page is going to go inside of this file called renderer. So there, there's this concept in uh, Electron that kind of separates uh, the runtime from what the user is actually seeing. So the code that we're looking at in here, like this is all um, like running in as a, uh, the Electron runtime. But then anything inside of Renderer has access to create DOM elements and access to the window. And if we want to communicate between the two, we have to do something special. But it is important to note that those are actually separate and uh, communicate in a certain way. But this basic app uh, creates a window, loads that file into it. Uh, you have access to this app variable, which comes from Electron. And you have uh, access to various events, like when the app is ready, we create the window. Uh, when all windows are closed, if we're on a Mac, we quit the app. Uh, or if we're not on a Mac, we quit the app. Um, when the app becomes active, we create the window. So this is the code that's kind of like creating that, that browser window. Oh, <laughs> uh, James is saying uh, Dash looks hungry. Quick, quick aside, let's take a look at the fish cam. I, I actually fed him today. He's just being extremely active. <laughs> I, don't, I guess you can't see him, Tony, but... I can see him on the stream thing. Oh, oh you're watching the stream too? Cool. Yeah, but... Um, yeah. He's just being, like, really, really active today. Like, I'll walk up, and he'll just, like, he'll swim up to me and say hello. I don't know. He's pretty awesome. <laughs> I, like, I, I hope, I hope he's okay. <laughs> I mean, he just seems like a happy fish. I don't know. Oh, well, okay. So that's our basic app. If we look at the index.html, you can actually see some interesting things happening there. So where it says we are using Node.js, this document.write, process.versions.node, you can't do this inside of the web browser, right? This doesn't exist. Like if I were inside of like actual Chrome and tried to do something like this, process is not defined. But inside of Electron, it is. And that actually gives you access to like what version of Node you're running and, and stuff like that. Um, it also says a uh, version of Chrome and the version of Electron. Uh, and then you'll notice we're actually using this require syntax inside of the HTML uh, because we have access to a node runtime. So we can uh, export and require in uh, modules just like you would inside of Node, but we can actually use them inside of the browser. And so this require brings in this renderer file, and this is where we're going to do all the front end stuff. So this is where we're going to create our view app. Um, we'll actually will have access to the clipboard from here, but uh, that's that's what we'll do. Cool. <laughs> James says the fish is such a diva. Uh, and Julian uh, says, how about we make a, a Slack or a Discord for all the followers? I do want to do that very soon. Um, and yes, look out for the announcement. It's coming soon. Also, my super long eight-hour stream, that's also coming soon. But it's going to happen because <laughs> we are a community here at Coding Garden. And yeah, cool. Any questions, comments, thoughts about this stuff, Tony, before we try to write some code? Um, I guess one of the things that I want to ask is, like, in theory, if you're running, say, uh, you got, like, your CSS stylings, do you need the internet to run your native desktop app? You don't. So one thing you can do is, like, just add a link tag in here to, like, a CDN. However, uh, uh, Electron talks about different uh, best security, best practices for security, and typically you don't want to do that because this app is running in a desktop environment. If some malicious entity got in between the request, uh, th between the actual script file or CSS file and the request for that file, they could actually send back some malicious code, and that would get loaded into your app. So typically, you do want to download everything locally. So we can actually do like an NPM install of Bulma and an NPM install of Vue. So that way, this app technically doesn't need access to the internet at all. OK, that's awesome. Yes. Um, so I think we had talked before about um, like the idea of if you were to make, say, like um, an Electron music thing, like if you were to communicate with MIDI mm. or something like that. Yeah, that, and I'm that just like thinking, like let's say you were using it and you didn't want to uh, connect it to the internet. Right, and then you would you wouldn't need the internet for it because it's just local. It's like reading USB devices, like when you're plugged in via MIDI. Um, yes. H however, it is possible to create Electron apps that do connect to the web, uh, but 
it's also possible to create ones that don't. <laughs> Oh yeah, and uh, James is mentioning, I'm at 1,200 subscribers, which is awesome. I reached that today. Uh, not that. YouTube. What? Hard refresh. Well, that number went down. It's rounding up. <laughs> well, no, I looked at it on another device earlier, and it said 1,200. Well, maybe this street... Tony, I think you made me lose seven subscribers. Shame on you. Okay. Do you have a witty response? Uh, I'll come back to it. I'll, I'll do a delayed witty response. <laughs> cool. Okay, so that's our basic app. Uh, let's let's get coding. So we clone down Electron. Uh, let's create a tray icon. So for a lot of this, we're actually just going to be reading the uh, the docs on Electron. So we're going to go into docs. Tony, we need to know how to make a tray icon. So basically, we want to create an icon in the the this is the status bar on Mac, I think. Uh, but what do you think we should search the documentation for to create a tray icon? Tray? <laughs> Let's try it. Tray. OK, so there is a thing. Uh, let's read about it. So add icons and context menus to the system's notification area. All right, I'm going to go get a beverage, Tony. But read through this. And here, I'll actually share control so you can scroll a little bit if you want to. But um, think about how are we going to add this to our app to actually get a tray icon. I'll be right back. All right, guys, let's, let's see if I can figure out what we're doing. I guess event emitter. Uh, I'm assuming that's like a event listener. I not entirely sure. All right, what have you figured out, Tony? Um, I'm assuming it's like an event listener. Um, but so you, it, it says event emitter. So I'm not really sure what that is. That means that it does have events associated with it, but the code up at the top is pretty much all we're going to need um, here. So let's take a look at that. We'll kind of compare it with the code that we already have in main.js. So it's bringing in app, menu, and tray. We're bringing in app and browser window. And then there is an app on ready here. And if you look in our code, there's an app on ready, but notice it calls this create window function. So this code here to create the tray, we should put inside of create window, this function here. Um, is that making sense? Kind of. I guess I'll just see it in action before it okay. kind of clicks. Cool. Um, but the the main thing is like trying to like look at the docs and associate that with like the code that we have and, and how to how to kind of bring them together. Um, let's let's just let's just copy this and see what happens. So uh, first, yeah, they actually don't have a note on it. But one thing that is interesting about this is they're declaring this tray variable outside of app ready. You actually need to do this because if you don't, then um, the garbage collector doesn't know that that variable is in use and your tray won't appear. So we need this tray variable. We're going to put that. Actually, I'll let you, do it to, let you do it, Tony. So put that tray variable right below our main window and set it equal to null. OK, cool. Uh, Jackson is saying that Tony's sound is louder than mine. Let's see if I can increase mine just a little bit. Check, 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 check. And I'll actually just decrease Tony just a little bit. All right, cool. So we've got that tray icon variable. Uh, now, right below where we create this uh, main window, let's also create our tray. So notice how in their code they say tray equals new tray. Let's do that. <laughs> I 
having some issues, I'm, I'm guessing. You know, fighting it. It keeps doing the auto correct. Okay, cool. So that creates the. So trigger. are we setting a, a path? Yeah. So we do need an icon. Um, let's find one real quick. Um, some sort of elephant. Elephant icon. Go to flat icon. What about this one? Wait. Thoughts? He's so happy. <laughs> so happy. Okay, let's use it. So yeah, let's um, use them. So let's just download this PNG. Uh, we will credit the author. Let's put this in our README. Cool. And free download. We'll go into that directory. Coding garden, clipboard elephant, electron quick start. Let's make a folder for uh, icon. And let's call this icon. Cool. So. Now inside of here, we have an icon folder with an icon.png. So Tony put the relative path to that image inside the quotes. Cool, you're very close. Relative means relative to this directory, so you actually need the dot in front of it. Uh, because if you if you just a uh. slash, if you do a slash, it's looking from the root of your hard drive rather than from this specific directory. Cool. Um, and then this is complaining that tray doesn't exist. We actually need to pull this in from Electron also, so we can add it up there. Cool. Uh, and there was a question in the chat from Julian. Uh, why does tray have to be null? Uh, the idea is um, Electron and its runtime and Node are doing a lot of things that we don't necessarily have control of. And if we were to create that variable inside of this function, the garbage collector, the thing that goes and looks for uh, memory that it can free up, would think that it can free up tray because it's not used outside of this function. And then our tray would just not appear at all in the in the status bar. Um, I read it somewhere in the docs. If we find it later, I'll, I'll point it out. But basically, you define, oh, actually, this it's very similar. So keep a global reference of the window object. If you don't, the window will be closed automatically when the JavaScript object is garbage collected. So same idea with the tray. If we were to declare these variables inside of this function, Electron wouldn't know that, or the JavaScript environment wouldn't know that those variables actually need to stay around, and it would try to clean them up. So we defined it out there, created inside of here, and it should um, stick around and, and not disappear. So if we look back at the docs, yeah. So I mean, actually, I think if we do this without even creating the context menu, we should at least see an icon in the tray. So. Uh, one thing about working with Electron is if you modify anything inside of main.js, you have to restart the app. If you modify anything inside of your HTML, you can just do a refresh. So if we change this to like, hello, coding garden, in here, if I refresh the page, it's going to get the latest stuff. But anything inside of main, we actually need to kill the app and restart it. So we'll kill it, restart it, and hey, there's our little... Uh, icon. Yeah. Tony? I, I can't see it on on my screen. <laughs> uh, it's the little blue icon right here up at the top of my screen. Now I've got like the little menu because I'm sharing the screen with you. I'll pull it up on the uh, stream. Oh, 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 there it is. Well, well can you? There can it is. You... I see it. I see it now. <laughs> okay. Can you move that thing so you can actually? Beautiful. Can see it? That's going to get in. Can you move that, though? Because that's going to get in your way of our. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can. I can. I can. There you go. Cool. <laughs> but yes, so now we've got a nice little icon. Awesome. Um, now let's do something with it. <laughs> so let's look at my uh, readme. So we created it. Now, one thing we want to do is um, hide and show the window when the tray icon is clicked. So instead of just like always showing this window, basically we want it so that like when we click on this, well, it, it, this window will basically be like a little menu up here that just like pops up. And then when we click it again, it'll go away. Um, similar to like some of these apps that I have installed. So let's figure out how to do that. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, Amal is saying, uh, try using an 800 by 800 image. OMG, yeah, it is pretty uh, pretty pixelated. Uh, one thing you can do, uh, let's find it. So um, if you look in their docs for native image, so uh, creates a new tray icon associated with the image. But if we go to native image, yes, yeah, so it actually supports scaling. So um, one thing you can do is you have your like lowest resolution icon in that folder. And then for uh, higher resolution screens, you can put larger images in there and it'll actually scale it up. So let's do that. And you just append like at the number of times. So we can download these other icons. So uh, 24 is 1.5 times 16. Is that right, Tony? I'm going to agree with you because <laughs> calculator right uh, 16 times 1.5 or did I say 1.4 1.5 cool uh, did I do that syntax right 1.5 X let's see if I did the syntax right yes I did okay so we've got our 1.5 and then 32 would be our uh, 2x and uh, James asked in the chat if we can use an SVG uh, sadly, no, and that's mainly because the um, native image class provided by Electron only supports PNG and JPEG, so you can't use an SVG. That that would be ideal, though, because then could we... You use... Go ahead. You could still use SVG within the app, though, if you wanted. Yeah, definitely, because the browser itself supports SVG. Uh, but this, because this is like being rendered natively, you can't use SVG there. Um, what is 64... Divided by 16, four times, okay. We're gonna go all the way up to 128. <laughs> uh, and then what is 128 divided by 16? Eight times. Cool, so now in our directory, we have all these different icon sizes. They just like gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger. Cool. And if we kill the app, so right now it's 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 pretty pixelated. <laughs> but if we kill the app, it should detect um, that we have a higher resolution screen, and it's still pretty pixelated. I don't think there's anything special we have to do there. Let's look at the docs real quick. Uh, if you want to support displays with a different DPI densities at the same time, you can put images with different sizes in the same folder using the, uh, the file name with the DPI suffixes. Did I do that right? Looks like they don't, they don't support 8x. The following suffixes are supported. Let's get rid of this one. Cool. I think we're going to stick with that for now. Don't know if it's working or not, but we are we are doing that. So hopefully that should work. OK. Um, so one thing we want to do is hide and show the window when the tray icon is clicked. So when we click it, we should show the window. And then if we click off it, the window should go away. Um, let's see if there's anything in the tray documentation. There is. Um, let's see, set highlight mode. Um, you can use highlight mode with a browser window by toggling between never and always modes when the window visibility changes. So this says when the tray icon is clicked on, um, if the window is visible, hide it, otherwise show it. And then when the window is shown, highlight the tray icon. So like, you notice when I click on the tray icon, it's like uh, blue. That means that it's highlighted. So this is the code that we need. Were you about to say something, Tony? Yeah, I was going to say, is this going to go right under the create uh, window? Yes, absolutely. So let's give it a try. Um, let's do it right, right there. Basically, we, we want to do this, these, uh, just a second. <laughs> Stop it, Tony. Uh, the, can you see my mouse? 
Yeah, yeah, I okay. can. Yeah. yeah, those are those are the things that we want to do right below we uh, right, right below where we create the tray. So when the tray is clicked on, um, if the window isn't visible, show it. If it is visible, hide it. And, it, and I guess um, one thing we'll uh, we'll also do is like just immediately hide the window when the app is launched, and then when they click on it, we'll we'll show it. So when we're doing that, would we say like on open, like view would be like false or something? Well, um, this Does that makes sense. This uh, win dot show we can actually just do main window dot show or main window dot hide. Um, that parenthesis there is extra. Yeah, get rid of that. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to get it. Uh, wait, actually no. I don't think. Can, can I copy and paste with your can thing? Yeah, just backspace it. There you go. Okay. And um, notice in their code, win is the browser window. So in our code, we want to use main window instead of just win. Don't freak out, Tony. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you can throw a semicolon at the end of line 16. Okay. Or at 16? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So when the tray is clicked on, if it's if it is visible, hide it. If it's not visible, show it. And then uh, we'll do the same thing for... Um, and same thing here. So instead of win, you actually want to use main window. Right. Um, so I'm assuming they are not adhering to CJ standards for right, their. So they, they don't use semicolons in their docs, right? You're right, Tony. Was that a sneeze? Yes, yes, yeah, sneeze to try to <laughs> mute my mic so okay. I didn't <laughs> kill the sound. Cool. It's a complete side note, but uh, I saw the uh, solo movie on Friday. Oh, it's out. And it was awesome. Cool. Yes, I want to see it. It's great. Uh, so James is saying in the chat, kind of off topic, but is the semicolon really necessary? Uh, no, it's not. It, uh, semicolons are optional in JavaScript. Uh, there's this thing called ASI, which is automatic semicolon insertion. So when the JavaScript engine is running your code, it will add semicolons later for you. Um, so they're not necessary. Uh, uh, so what's that? Qu question here. Yeah. When it auto filled um, set highlight mode, it capitalized light. In their thing, light is not capitalized. It, let's, let's, oh, I think it, it, it popped up because you capitalized the L there. Oh, you're right, you're right, okay. <laughs> so yeah, make sure you don't do that. Um, but as Julian is mentioning, you can configure your ESLint to say, I don't want semicolons, and then it won't show errors if there are not semicolons. Um, I have mine configured to say, show errors, if there are not semicolons. Um, and that that comes down to like your ESLint config. There, I, I prefer semicolons because I come from a, a C-sharp background and in C-sharp and Java and C and C++, semicolons are all required. And so for years, my pinky has been hitting the semicolon key. And now code, it, look, it looks like a sentence without a period to me if there's no semicolon on it. But that is just an opinion and a preference. You can, you are free to code without them. Okay, um, you you did it, Tony. <laughs> let's uh, let's give it a try. So, uh, I, I think one thing we also want to do though is um, immediately after creating the window, we hide it. So that way, when the app launches, you don't see the window. But then, when you click on the um, the tray icon, we will see the window. Okay. So, so do we need to do that? Like on launch, we need to say hide? Yes. So where do you think we should put that? 
Uh, let's go up real quick. Like up, up in here? No, actually, wouldn't we do it like right there after we uh, call main window? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we'll do main window dot on. Actually, no, just hide. Exactly, yeah. So immediately after we create the window, just hide it. And you actually want to invoke it because it is a function. Do we have to cool. give it any sort of argument or parameters? That should be it. It's, it's exactly the same as like what's happening right here. OK, let's give this a try. So uh, because we modified main.js, we do need to kill the app. Kill it. And once we restart it, we shouldn't see our window, don't think. But if we click this, we see the window. And you'll notice that the thing is highlighted. Uh, but then if we click it again, the window disappears, right? Or if we click it and then click out of it, well, actually, I guess it's still technically highlighted. Uh, the window disappears. But that's basically what we just did. So now whenever you um, click the tray icon, it will show the window. And if you click it, it will hide the window. So this is going to be like our menu of um, <laughs> a menu of previous copies that you have done. Cool. <laughs> and Julian said he started using semicolons after watching my tutorials. And you're watching me on a 55-inch TV. That's awesome. Um, OK, Tony, any thoughts, questions, comments about this or what we've done so far? Yeah, um, I guess my my only question would be, would it be that difficult to make it to where when it loads, like it actually appears like right there on the top toolbar, like the other apps? That, that is on our, to, on our checklist. Basically, we want to, whenever you open it, we need to reposition the window to be like right underneath it. Yes. Right, OK. Cool, let's look at our checklist. So that's done. Uh, first, we'll, we'll hide the window Chrome, though. So the window Chrome is basically like this bar up at the top with like the, the close and minimize buttons. We don't want that, because ours is going to be just like a little pop-up window. So we can actually hide that. Let's take a quick stretch. <clears throat> So let's let's hide that stuff. Um, back to the docs. So I want to hide this stuff, Tony. Do you remember what this is? So in our code, what is this thing? That is the. Uh, it's not the main window. It is. It is it something associated with the main window? It it actually is the main window. So uh, this code oh. right here, it says a browser window with width eight hundred by six hundred. That is literally what creates this thing right here. Okay, so should we should be able to have like some sort of thing that we put in there, like toolbar equals false or something, right? Something like that. So let's let's find it in the docs. Um, and the reason I wanted you to recognize that is because. Browser window is where we're going to have to go in the docs to actually figure this out. So if we go into browser window, um, let's find it. It's on the screen right now, Tony. Do you see it? <laughs> oh, frameless window. Yeah. yeah, so to create a window without Chrome or a transparent window in an arbitrary shape, you can use the frameless window API. Um, so just looking at this, how... it looked false. <laughs> Frame false. Cool. Yeah, just like I said. Just like you said, Tony. OK, so in here, we'll say frame is false. All right. And we'll kill it. We'll restart it. And it's gone. Look at that. Hey, I knew <laughs> something without knowing it. Well, and I think the that's that's the main thing. Like, use your intuition and then like try to search the docs to find the thing that you think might be there, you know? Cool. Coding Garden is making me less ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, that's my new tagline. OK. Um, so yes, we have hid the window chrome. Awesome. Next thing, reposition the window by tray icon when shown. So basically, we want to take this and move it up here. So we need to also find this in the docs. <laughs> what, should we, what should we search for in the docs to find it? What, what are we looking for? Um, Repositioning the window. So we want to change the position of the window. So I guess 
position. Should I like control F for that? Okay. There are six results. Uh, feel free, like you feel free to to search. Okay. I think if you press keep, press uh, in, press enter, you'll you'll should see the next result. Oh no! I think I gotta click. Oh. I don't. Yeah, it, I don't click, think it's let me do anything. Or you can click these arrows and it'll go to like the next result. Okay. Event moved. New position. Hmm. Window set position. There we go. Okay. That might be your thing. Uh, yeah, so let's try it. So we want to use this in our code. Um, when do we want to set the position? On click. Or actually, when, it, when, it, when it's on, rather. Yeah, when it's, when it's shown. So I'm thinking we should probably put that code inside of here because this is when the window is shown. So when we show it, set the position. Um, how do you think we're going to write this code? So you notice in the docs it says win.setPosition. What do you think we need to do? So we're going to do main window dot set position. Yeah, give it a try. But my question is, is how can we somehow get some sort of uh, data about where the icon is relative to where we're clicking? That's what we'll need to do next. Absolutely. Let's just see if this works. Though. Okay. So, so, so we'll let's, yeah, let's do like main window dot set position, and then um, by looking at the docs, can you determine what you need to pass into this thing? Some uh, x and y coordinates for the uh, the screen position. Cool. So let's just put it at zero zero to see if that that works. So that should be like the top left corner, right? So, yeah. Okay, and then we're not doing any sort of animation, so we can leave that up. Yes. All right, so we modified main, so we need to kill it, restart it. All right, Tony, I'll give you the honors of clicking the icon. Hey, yo. So it set the position as zero, zero. Great. And now what you were mentioning is we need to figure out uh, where that tray icon is so we can put the uh, window there, right? And right. Yeah, so we're working on that right now. Um, let's look under tray. Also, I don't know if it's on there, but could we do like some sort of like elephant sound effect every time something gets saved to it? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so like we could actually, <laughs> we could actually use the... Um, just the browser audio API to like play a sound whenever somebody copies something. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, some uh, yeah, James in the chat awesome. mentioned I... we should make we should make the window elephant shaped. How could, can you do like polygon shapes for windows? Um, it's possible. So I have um, you could basically make a transparent window, and then have some sort of polygon like in the center of the window and the edges are transparent. So you actually see the, the, the window itself is just the shape of the polygon that's inside of it using something like canvas. Oh, that would, maybe like really that would be positioned amazing. Divs. <laughs> uh, I think that's like a stretch, not for today, but yeah, it's, it's possible. Okay, Tony, so let's find in the tray docs, how are we gonna find the position of the, um, the tray icon? Uh, I guess search. Uh position again or would... position oh position point the position of the event hmm maybe no Let's keep going position point wait mouse enter that could be maybe what we use position point cool Hello, Chris. Welcome to the stream. It says he found me from Coding Train. Awesome. Coding Train is awesome. <laughs> Wait, I think this is it right here. So that is context menu. Technically, we're not using a context menu because we are like just using the window itself. Um, <laughs> actually, I don't know if you're going to find it by searching. For, uh, go down a few more. 
I think that's the last couple of them. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I think get bounds is actually what we want because um, this will tell you exactly where the tray icon is, and then we can position the window based on that. Um, the, the main reason is like we don't want to just use the mouse click because, well, right now I'm running the app on Mac, and so my tray icon is like up here. But like, what if I click right there? We actually want the window to show below the icon. So like depending on where I click inside of it might make it different. And then also like on Windows, the taskbar can actually be very um, like higher than this. So we need to know specifically where can we put this window in relation to the icon itself rather than just where the person clicked. So yeah, let's try this get bounds thing. Yeah, I almost want to say like you do a zero zero from like the bottom left corner of the uh, icon. Maybe. Like right where it touches the bar. <laughs> let's figure it out. So uh, what I want you to do is when when we show the window, let's log the bounds of the tray. Um, an interesting thing to note about this is when you're doing a console log inside of main.js, those logs will actually show up inside of your terminal because that's like the main electron process. If you were to do a console log in here or inside of the renderer file, that would show up inside of your developer tools console. So if we kill this and then restart it, uh, because this console log is in main.js, we should see the bounds logged um, inside of this, this terminal window. So when we click it, there we go. So it gives us the x, y, and width and height of the tray icon. So we can now use that to reposition the window to be where the tray icon is. Yeah, Tony? Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So uh, instead of logging it, well, actually, let's keep, let's keep, well, before we log it, let's store it in a variable. So let's say like const bounds equals tray dot get bounds. And then let's log the bounds. And then where should we set the position now that we have bounds? So we would set uh, the x. Or do we have to say like bounds and then define it accordingly? Yes, so ba uh, bounds is an object, so we have access to all these properties like bounds.x, bounds.y, bounds.width, bounds.height. Right, so we're going to do bounds.x and bounds.y here, right? Yeah, let's give it a try. All right. We're really lucky somehow there'll be an error and it automatically becomes shaped like an elephant. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. So we do have to restart it. All right, Tony, I'll give you the honors. Click the icon. Drum roll, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, they, uh, they can't hear my drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and there we go. We did it. <laughs> cool. Um, let's do this though. So um, when the window is launched, let's make it a little bit uh, narrower. So instead of 800, let's do like I don't know 400. Let's kill it. That's a little better. I can I can see it now, Tony. Can you see it? Um, <laughs> like yeah, it's good. We're going to have the, the pasted things listed there. Uh, Chris in the chat asking is asking, are you guys using VS Code's live share to do uh, uh, pair coding? We are not. Um, I actually used live share in a pairing episode I did with Brooks Builds. Uh, but right now, we're actually just using a Zoom video conference, um, mainly so that Tony can type in my terminal and control my browser, too, because you can't exactly do that with live share. Julian's asking what I'm drinking. I'm drinking a tangerine LaCroix. My green screen is cutting it off, so you can't really see it. We're doing great, Tony. 
This is a this is we're making progress. So let's let's look at our README. Reposition the window by the tray icon when it's shown. Awesome. Okay, so now we've got like the basic functionality of like what our native app is actually doing for the most part. Now we want to start handling clipboard stuff and actually build out a UI inside of this window. Um, <laughs> cool. So for one, let's let's stop logging the bounds because we don't really need that anymore. Let's get rid of that. But I do want to install Bulma and View in here so we can use it inside of our uh, HTML. So let's kill this. Um, I'm just going to go to npm and search for Bulma. I think we could probably just do npm install Bulma, but I don't know uh, if that's the exact package name. Yeah. And it's it's also important to note, like we are going to be using Vue.js, uh, Vue but we are, we're just going to use plain Bulma. There's this library called Bufy, which gives you Vue.js components that you can use, but our app is going to be so basic, we don't really even need that. We're just going to use the basic CSS. Yeah, so we can do an npm install of Bulma. So Tony, go ahead and do a, well, just to make sure. So we're inside of that electron folder. We'll do an npm install of Bulma right there. <laughs> Tony is the future legacy of CJ. You can do it, Tony. That's from Julian in the chat. <laughs> Okay. We used to have this running joke that I was CJ's uh, imaginary friend. Did we? Or was I your imaginary friend? Way back friend? when. Somebody was somebody's imaginary friend. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so we have Bulma. Now we want to bring this into our uh, HTML. I actually haven't done this. I think we can just actually direct, directly reference it from node modules. So uh, inside of here, in our node modules, this is my break t uh, timer. Let's also take a quick stretch. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Chris, yeah, all of my all of my live streams are recorded and um, uh, available immediately after the stream, so you can you can watch them after. Also, I also uh, push the code up so you can see that too. Are you drinking anything, Tony? Uh, no. No, I am not. <laughs> okay. But yeah, inside of node modules, we have Bulma. And if we look at the CSS, we have access to Bulma.css. Now, I'm pretty sure we can just add a link tag that references the node modules folder. So let's try that. So right there, just do uh, node modules slash Bulma slash CSS slash bulma.css. All right, save it. We'll uh, relaunch the app. Nope, not that. And look at that. We got a fancy little font. I think that means it's working. Uh, so we are actually loading in the Bulma, Bulma library now. Cool. Um, excuse me. Let's also install Vue.js so we can use that inside of our renderer to create a view instance. Um, yeah, Tony, so do a, an npm install of uh, well, uh, view, <laughs> npm install view. <laughs> you could be subscribed. I think we should make anything. this thing. Wait, what's that, Tony? Uh, elephants are gray, right? Yes. OK. Uh, I kept thinking they were pink, and I was like, no, that's not right. <laughs> that's not right, Tony. Uh, wh why, why do you say uh, that? Oh, I was going to say, like, we should make the shell, or like the, or not the shell, like the body of our document, like maybe like a nice little pale gray. Sure. Yeah, definitely. OK, so we have Vue. Uh, so we installed Bulma and Vue. Let's now create our Vue instance inside of renderer.js. So um, as I mentioned earlier, Main.js is all about, like, this is like more of the native stuff. I mean, technically, we can still access native stuff in the renderer, but this is a, uh, a separate process from the actual browser itself. And then in index.html, it brings in renderer.js. And so this file is where we can actually access the DOM and do things in the, the browser window itself. So let's. Let's create a new view instance. So say uh, const app 
well, first let's require in view. So do uh, const view equals require view. Yeah, you can do a capital view. Uh, I'll, I'll fix it afterwards. So this needs to be lowercase and this needs to be, can be like that. Cool. Uh, now we'll say um, const app equals new view. A new view. Uh, no, no parentheses uh, needed. And we will invoke it, pass in an object. And inside of there, uh, type EL, this stands for element. Uh, make sure you tab it. And in single quotes, do um, pound app. So we're basically telling it where our Vue.js app is going to live on the document. Uh, do lowercase app. Cool. And then we'll also create some data for our view instance. Uh, so let's just create a title and set the title equal to uh, clipboard elephant. Uh, so uh, just say you want a, a property called title. Yep. And then the value is a string that has clipboard elephant inside of it. Clipboard Elefante, cool. And just for good measure, I'm gonna add in some emojis. Cool. And then we'll do that one. Cool, so we got our basic view instance. It's saying it's looking at the app element and it has a title. So in our HTML, let's get rid of all this stuff that we have there now. And let's just create a, a main element and give it an ID of app. Cool. And then inside of the main, let's just create like an H1. And then we'll use handlebars to um, reference title. So just inside of handlebars, just put title. And you want that to be a lowercase title. Because this title matches up with the title over here. So we should get just a basic H1 that says uh, clipboard elephant inside of it. All right, let's try it out. It broke. OK, here's how we debug it. <laughs> um, inside of our main.js, this is commented out. But basically, we can, we can uncomment this so that the moment the window opens, we actually uh, see the dev tool so we can do some debugging inside of the, the window itself. So I'll uncomment that, and we'll start it back up. Warning, you are using the runtime only build of view where the template compiler is not available. OK, um, if that's the case, I think we actually need to reference the built version of view. Let's see if we can do this. So inside of here, can we do like view? Let's see what we have access to in node modules. Where is it? L M N O P Q S. Did it install correctly? Uh, maybe this is just not refreshing. Okay, let me close VS Code and reopen it. Um. Yeah, there it is. Oh yes, man. VS Code. Oh, like I, I like it overall, but it just has weird issues every now and then that, that like I never had with Adam. Um, question in the chat from Julian. For my next live stream, um, I am going to be using. I'm not going to be using Firebase. I'm going to be using Firestore, which is like the big brother of Firebase. Um, I think I will use Vuex. It, it really depends on what libraries are available to go along with Vue and Firestore. Um, and uh, Chris is asking how I got the emojis. Uh, this is actually built into the Mac. On Macs, you can do command control space 
and you get an emoji menu. Um, I do believe there is an app out there that will work on Windows too, where you can get access to emojis. <laughs> cool. Uh, and actually, uh, an Electron app that me and Tony want to build is something like this, where you can do a keyboard shortcut and then get access to like a little menu. Don't we, Tony? Emojis for life. <laughs> cool. Um, so I think what we want is we actually want to bring in a view from dist. So if we do view slash dist slash view.js, this is the full version, so we don't have to use uh, a, the compiler or anything like that. We're... All right, let's try it now. Oh, go inside of Electron Quick Start and then do npm start. Hey, it says clipboard elephant. Look at that. So it's working. So our, our Electron app starts up this browser window. That browser window loads index.html. Index.html loads Bulma and then this renderer file and then has like our basic template right here. And then the renderer file brings in view and then creates our instance, which sets the title. Awesome, we are on our way, Tony. Uh, let's take a look at the Bulma docs and figure out what are we going to do inside of here to like show um, clipboard items and stuff like that. Um, Bulma's website, bulma.io. Let's look at the docs. Um, Maybe components? Have you used Bulma much, Tony? No. No. Not as much as a. Uh, bootstrap? Materialize or bootstrap? Yeah. Okay. So we'll just have to click around, see if we can find something we like. Um, we could use cards. I don't think we want to. Um, this could work. We could have like our uh, title up here, and then each of the items will be something that's on your clipboard. What do you think? Yeah, so this would be like our, like, you'd start running the app, and it would be like, literally this, um, this little window. Like, here. let's say we, yeah. Oh, okay. What were you gonna say though? Well, I was gonna say like, uh, um, you'd be able to save like all this list of copied stuff if you wanted to. Yes. Yeah. And actually, I, I didn't talk about our stretch features earlier, but right now the the way the app is gonna work is when you start it up, it will start saving your your clips like the things you copy. But if you ever close the app, you're gonna lose all of those. So a stretch is to add like a local database so that um, if you close the app and reopen it, everything that was in your clipboard last time you had it open will, will still be there. But yeah. Okay, so let's do this. Um, let's just take all of this code and put it in our HTML here. Okay. And then now where it says repositories, let's make that be handlebars with title. So, there we go. Now we're getting a nice little app. Um, it is, there's some interesting like, mar oh, is this the scroll bar actually? Yeah, I think that's the scroll, but that's decent. So we've got our title and then we probably, we probably don't want the search bar right now. Like maybe that'd be a cool feature to add later. Like you can actually search through your clipboard history. Um, but really, we want to get rid of these two things and just show the list. So let's do that. Uh, what do you what do you think we need to delete, Tony, out of here? Uh, we need to remove the input search. Just that. That and the uh, the other thing. Well, I'm gonna say uh, div panel block the whole thing because that represents. Um, like this whole element up here. 
Let's get rid of that. You're just gonna comment that out? Or just get rid okay. of, yeah, just get rid of it because we don't need it. So now if we refresh, it's gone. Cool. And then we don't really need any tabs either. So we'll just get rid of all of those. Cool. It's decent. And then we'll like get rid of that stuff at the bottom. So we don't need this button or that checkbox. All right, basic app. And this is where we're going to list out the things that people have copied to the clipboard. Cool. Um, I don't like that this this is there. I think this is like the scroll bar. That's like all yeah. So the scroll bar is always showing. I think we can we can make this so that the scroll bar only shows if it's needed. So we can actually just do that in our own CSS. So let's just add that in here. So in here, let's add a file, call it styles.css. And uh, we'll say the body has an overflow of um, auto. So that way, the scroll bar only appears if it actually needs to. And then we can bring in the style here. So we'll link in uh, styles.css. Well, that didn't work. Uh, let's. Do we have access to the dev tools? Let's bring those dev tools back open. I thought you needed to uh, kill and then refresh the thing if you're using a, or manipulating the index. Uh, not the index, the main.js, because the index is what gets loaded in, oh. into here. So that we should be able to just do a, like a hard refresh. Let's see though. So. Ooh, maybe we. Maybe... So is that something with. Go ahead. The... The menu or the Bulma, like. I think. Is it's... there like a Bulma stylings? Um, we are about to figure it out, Tony. So we have the element inspector here. If we look at main, that thing isn't overflowing, and if we look at body, that isn't. But if we look at HTML, yeah. So HTML by default has this uh, overflow Y as scroll. So in our styles, we we don't want to target body. We actually want to target HTML. So if we target that, that should turn it off. Hey, look at that. It's clean. Cool. Are you excited, Tony? I'm excited. That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, let's keep moving. Uh, so right now we have just like some dummy data in there, but let's look at our checklist. So we created our, our view instance. And okay, so one thing we'll have to do is basically just constantly look at the clipboard to see if something new was added. So um, if we look at the documentation for Electron, they do give you access to the clipboard. But as far as I know, there aren't really any events for like something was added to the clipboard, I don't think. We can actually scroll through. So. One thing it allows you to do is, so you can you can bring the clipboard in, and then you can read the text that's currently on the clipboard. So when somebody copies something, we can read text so that we can actually store what they copied. Um, if they copied images, you also get access to that. I think in this basic version, we're just going to handle copying text. But let's see, do they have any? Yeah, they so. This is why I'm saying you set interval. They don't have any sort of events. They don't have any way of saying something new was added to the clipboard. So what I want to do is create an interval, which is basically a function that's going to run every second or every 500 milliseconds that will get the latest value from the clipboard and see if we've stored that yet. And if we haven't, it will then add it to our stored clipboard text. Does that make sense? Yeah, is that going to be like super intensive, like on the memory though? Um, not that I know of. <laughs> like you, you can you, you can do this in JavaScript. You can say set interval, and then uh, you give it a function. We'll just do like console.log. Hello, and then we'll just put like the current date, so it's like totally new. And we want to run this function every 500 milliseconds. Go. It's actually not running as fast as I thought it would. 
Um, but no, this 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 should be totally fine because um, we will have a place where we're keeping track of the um, like the we'll have an array of all the previous history elements, uh, hi history of all the previous clipboard elements. Um, but yeah, not that I know of. We should be fine. And um, I'm gonna refresh this page so that stops. And this is Newbie Tuesday, so we're not we're not caring that much about memory usage, are we, Tony? I don't know. Tony, are you there, Tony? What's up? Hi. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's do this. So. In renderer, so w the, the cool thing about this though is a lot of these things that you see in the docs that they're requiring in, we could technically require these in inside of our renderer, which is the thing the browser has access to. So we literally get access to the clipboard inside of the browser. Andreas, welcome to the stream. Hello. Okay, so um, right above where we bring in view, and actually let's just get rid of that comment. Let's require in the clipboard. So you can see how they did that there in the docs. So um, yeah, we're not, we're not gonna do any of that other stuff just yet though. So now we have access to the clipboard in here. And uh, so I mentioned we do wanna set an interval to see if a new item has been added to the clipboard. So let's do this. Inside of our view instance, we'll have a mounted method. So when the view app gets mounted, that's when we'll start listening to see if the clipboard has changed. So let's add mounted right there. And mounted is a function. So you can just do uh, mounted parentheses and then give it a, a function body. Cool. And inside of here is where we will set the interval. So let's say uh, set interval. And the thing we want to do is check the clipboard. So uh, inside of the parentheses there, just say this dot check clipboard. We're gonna have to create this, it doesn't exist. And then the second parameter is how often, uh, don't invoke it, we just wanna pass the function reference. And then the second parameter is how often do we wanna do this? And let's just say 500 milliseconds. Yeah, cool. And so now we need this check clipboard method. So right after mounted, let's add our um, um, methods. <laughs> So methods is an object. You can add that there. <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to read that chat. Um, you feeling okay, Tony? Are you okay today? You doing good? You, you doing good? Yeah, I'm okay. I, I woke up from a nap before before this. I was really tired. <laughs> okay. Someone in the chat thinks you might be drinking today, but I don't know. Give me no, no, not I'm, today. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Cool. So inside of our methods, we need a check clipboard. So let's create a function called check clipboard. Yep. Parentheses, function body, and inside of here is where we will actually check the clipboard. So uh, the method that we're going to need is... Uh, read text because this is going to get the content of the clipboard as plain text. Just a second. I'm going to go ahead and copy something because I don't know the last thing I copied. Well, actually, I guess it would have been like the uh, maybe the HTML. Okay, cool. So um, here's what we want to do we want to say, um, let's store it in some variable. So let's say like uh, const text equals clipboard.read text. Awesome. And for now, let's just log it out. So just do like a console.log of the text. Cool. So what should happen is whenever we uh, start up the app, 
it's going to start listening and every 500 milliseconds it's going to get the latest thing that's on the clipboard and then just log it to the console so um, over here let's open up our dev tools and we'll refresh the app and there we go you can see the um, the log going up there this content is the clipboard and if I copy something new that's going to be the thing that it logs and if I copy something new that'll be the thing that it logs so um, it's working, Tony. We're, we're watching the clipboard for changes, and we actually have access to it, so we can store it, right? So right. now we actually want to store this on our view instance. So where do I have this? OK, so we're checking the clipboard. Next thing is actually store that text in a history array. So in on our view instance, let's just create a history property and just set that equal to an empty array. And this is basically where we're going to keep track of the clipboard. Let's just make that an empty array. Yeah, just like that. So we have our history there. And now, anytime we get some new text, we want to push it into the history array. So let's, let's do this. So basically, we first need to check, like, is this text already in history? Because if it is, we don't want to push it in over and over again, right? Because we're literally checking every 500 milliseconds. So first, we want to say, is this text in history? So um, say um, if history brackets, oh, well, actually this dot history, because we're going to be accessing the, the instance itself. So if this dot history brackets, and we want to access the last uh, uh, square brackets. Here, I'll help you out just a second. So we want to access the last element of the array. How might we do that? Uh, we do like the array dot length. My, uh, my, my, that would... my minus one. Does that <laughs> uh, make sense? Yeah, definitely. So if you do uh, this dot history dot length minus one, that's going to be the very last element in the array. So let's let's do that. Let's say if this dot this dot history. Um, at this dot history dot length minus one. So that's going to grab the last element. Um, actually, is there an, there might be a new last method built into the array? Let's see. Last modified array last. Last index of. Okay, no, I don't think there's anything built in that will do it. So yeah, uh, basically we say length minus one. That's going to give us the last element. And let's say if that does not equal the text. So say um, not equal text. So basically we're checking is this thing in the array or not. Then we'll just say this uh, inside of this statement. We'll say uh, this dot history dot push text. Cool. So basically, if that text that they copied was not in the history array, we're going to push it into that array. Awesome. So now let's actually show it in the view. So instead of all these uh, dummy dummy spans, they're not dummies. They're just not useful to us right now. Um, here. Basically, we want to repeat this element for every item in the history array, right? Do you remember what view directive we can use to do that? I'm talking to you, Tony. No, I don't think so. <laughs> cool. Uh, do you remember um, uh, V4? Oh, v, like V4. Um, I think every time that we uh, push something in here. Yeah, so we're going to use the v4 directive. Basically, the way that works is you give it an array, and for every element in that array, it's going to create this, this element for us. So let's say uh, v-4 equals and we'll say um, item in history. Uh, we'll do a space. So item space in space history. So 
history exactly matches up with the array on our data. And then item is just the name that we're going to give to each thing inside of that. So that array is just going to have text inside of it. And so here, we want to actually show what that text is. So um, let's just do handlebars with item inside of it. Cool. Hey, Joe, welcome to the stream. Um, and Chris is saying, in his humble opinion, <laughs> um, this should be a double equals. It's totally OK to do that. So with a single equal, uh, wait, did we have did we have it as double? We had it as single, yeah. Um, with a single equals, it actually does coercion. But because we're comparing two things of type text, it shouldn't matter anyways. But we'll do double equals. And yeah, I think we've done it, Tony. Are you ready? Refresh. Yep, let's see it. OK, so that's the last thing I copied. Let's copy this. And if we look at it, it's there. <laughs> and let's go to like the electron. Well, let's go to MDN and copy some stuff. Copy. There it is. Let's go to Coding Garden and copy that. There it is. So we have, we have, we have a history. We're doing it. You don't seem as excited as I am, Tony. No, oh, I, I am. <laughs> Don't, don't worry guys Tony's excited sweet so yeah so like we are literally keeping track of everything that we copy and now we can add a feature in where like you click on something and that puts that on the clipboard so you can paste that in instead awesome uh, one thing I do want to do is like let's make the title centered I think they have a helper for that were you gonna say something Tony yeah I was gonna say like um, are we gonna do any sort of like timestamp or Anything like when you copy something in? Yeah, we can do that too. So the moment we push it into the array, let's also store the date. And then you can actually see whenever, um, when, when, when did you actually copy that thing? Definitely, we can do that. Uh, so Bulma has this has text centered class. So we can put that on the title just to throw that in the center. Oh. And that will, whoa. What did I, oh, I, I got. <laughs> Get rid of that. There we go. Oh, and has text centered is literally the last thing I copied, so it shows it there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so that's great. Uh, one thing, one thing I do want to do is actually show the um, uh, what do you call it? The the new lines and the actual formatting of the thing that you copy. Because you'll notice, like, if I copy this HTML here, when we look inside, it's all, like, jumbled up. And I would like to show it in the same way that you actually copied it, right? Oh, yeah. In a, uh, would under... it also make sense? Go ahead. I was going to say, would it also make sense to do it to where, like, if you click on, say, that whole bit of text, like, it automatically copies it to your clipboard? That's our next feature, Tony. Absolutely. Um, and Andreas is saying, oh, no, uh, yeah, Andreas is saying, did you try to copy the same text twice? Let's try it. So I copied, well, let's try something simple. So if I copy panel, it shows up. But if I copy panel again, it should only show up once because it doesn't match the previous one. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Cool. Uh, Chris says uh, he is a super noob for um, Electron and View, but awesome. It, they're pretty fun. Like I, I, I only started messing around with them probably, I don't know, a few months ago. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. OK, but uh, one thing we can do is let's put this inside of a pre tag. So a pre tag uh, is uh, keeps your things pre formatted. So if we were to. Um, copy something that has formatting like this, it will maintain it. So you'll actually see that it, um, um, maintains the, the indentation and stuff like that. Right. Uh, however, it does have like, we, we don't necessarily want it to use like have that background color or to use like a monospace font. So let's fix that. If we view the um, developer tools, 
Where are they? Cool. Um, uh, go ahead. Can I ask like a side note question to that? Yeah, absolutely. Is there any sort of um? This might seem like a super simple thing, but is there any sort of like text um like detector where like you could put like code in the way like a language detector can detect what the language is? It'll detect what language the code is in. Uh, I think it might exist. Are you getting at like potentially doing like syntax highlighting or something like that? Yeah, like or like just uh, like like what if you were copying that code and then like a little thing says is the uh, this might be JavaScript or you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's doable. Um, my guess is there probably is an npm package out there that can detect the language of some source code that you pass to it. It probably exists. Yeah, that was just like a. Just side note. Random thought of mine. I'm sure. I'm sure it exists. So right now, I'm just like inspecting uh, this element to see like how we can style it. To for one, we don't want it to have that color unless we're hovering over it. So um, I am inspecting like this pre tag. If we, yeah, I think we want to get rid of padding, so that it shows up like pretty normal, and then we also want to get rid of background color. Cool, because then it only gets a background color if we highlight it. So let's create a style for pre that has no background color and no padding. So in our styles, let's say a pre background color we'll say inherit, which will be just like the default one. And then uh, did we get rid of padding? Is that what that was? Yeah. And padding should be zero. OK, decent. And then also uh, font family, we'll just say inherit. So that will take the default font family. And Comic we'll... Sans. <laughs> Comic Sans. And so that won't, yeah, so now it's just like the, the default font. Cool. Um... Oh, uh, Emmy is saying uh, something like a uh, source code detection has to exist because Waka Time knows what what she's coding in, and GitHub does as well. Yeah, I think that might work based on uh, file extension, but it could also just be like, um, yeah, based on the source code that you're writing, it is likely to be X language. Cool. There's this weird spacing at the beginning. I'm curious what that's coming from. Let's see. Uh, let's just do this. We're going to put a new line at the beginning whenever we render it. So <laughs> we're going to say uh, new line plus the item. And that should put it on the next line, which gives it, yeah, look at that. Cool. And so now, um, also like when we copy things that have, I don't know. Let's look at, um, yeah, so like my stream from last night, these are the notes, but like this indentation should also show up, like that tab there. Oh, well, it doesn't, oh well. Well, maybe not because I copied from there, but what if we look at the raw version of it and then copy it from there? Yeah, like what if I copy this? Yeah, so see, notice it keeps the, the indent there so we can actually see that. Cool. All right, Tony, uh, if we look at our readme, we are storing the text of the clipboard. Um, we could show a notification. Uh, let's let's push this to the end because I do I do want to get to just like, I mean, right now this app is useless unless when you click on something, it puts that in your clipboard so you can actually use it, right? Um, right. Actually, let's do this first. Okay, so we are showing the history. But let's show it in reverse order. So like the most recent thing you copied shows up at uh, the top instead of at the bottom. Right? Yeah, that should be like us basically taking the um, array and like reversing it, right? Yes, but in Vue.js, instead of like reversing the array itself, we can create a computed property. So let's do that right here. So just say uh, computed and computed is an object. <laughs> and 
And uh, don't forget your comma there. But inside of computed, we get to create a function which will basically reverse the array for us. Uh, let's call this. Um, I mean, we can call it history reversed. And I wouldn't call it show history reverse because the idea of a computed property is that it's not that you're going to call this function. It, it just exists as, as a property. So yeah, let's call it history reversed. This actually is a function, but when we use it, we don't use it as a function. So um, history reversed, cool. And inside of here, we basically want to return that array reversed. Um, there is a built-in reverse function, but I think that modifies the array. Yeah. Uh, the reverse method reverses an array in place, meaning it actually changes the, the order of the array. We don't want to change the order of this array. We want to keep it the way it is. So what we'll do is we'll copy it first, and then we'll reverse it. So inside of here, do a return. And we'll say this dot history dot slice. So slice will make a copy. And then we'll do dot reverse after that, uh, outside of it. So basically what we're saying is make a copy of history and then reverse it. And now we have the array, but in the opposite order. So um, that's great. And now inside of our template, instead of uh, v4ing over history, we can just v4 over um, history reversed, and it'll work in, in the same way. So that's there. But if I copy this, it shows up at the top. If I copy this, it shows up at the top. Cool. Good enough. Um, now let's. When you click on an item, put it on the clipboard. Are you still with me, Tony? Yep. Cool. Um, interesting thing about computed properties is that they are only computed when their dependencies change. So like this only ever runs if we like push something new into the history array. Otherwise, it's just going to keep its value, which is pretty cool. OK, so when we click an item, we want to set its text on the clipboard. So let's do this. Um, on the the item itself, we'll just add a click event listener. So right here, do uh, at, so at sign click. Equals, and we'll say um, item, item clicked. And then invoke it, and let's pass in the item itself. So now we need a function called item clicked. So inside of our view instance under methods, we can create item clicked, which takes in the item. And now this is where we actually want to set the clipboard contents, like when you click on it. So um, if we look at the docs here, what method do you think that we can use to write to the text? Mm. Uh, write HTML. Um, why not write text? Wait, no, 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 no. no write text. I'm sorry, <laughs> I was looking at the bottom first. No, no worries. Um, that one would, would probably work. I'm not sure what the difference is between like write HTML and write text, but yeah, write text is yeah should should be easy enough. That's I think that's what we want. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Chris. Can you talk about uh the this this scope when doing a computed property? Uh, basically, when you're working with a view instance or a view component inside of your lifecycle methods like mounted or unmounted or created inside of any computed property inside of any methods, this is the component itself or the instance itself. So. Um, and and all, anything on your data gets put on the instance. So you'll notice like inside of our method, we say this.history.push. View actually binds uh, this function to the instance of uh, your view instance. Same thing with your computed properties. So inside of here, this.history is referencing data. Inside of here, this.history is referencing data also. Hopefully that was 
not too much of a word jumble. <laughs> um, but basically, every every function inside of your view instance or view component component will have its this set to the this of the instance or the instance of the component. Cool. Now, Tony, we just found clipboard.write text. So let's do just that. So let's say uh, clipboard.write text and pass in uh, item, because item is the actual text itself. Um, yeah. OK, I think we've done it. So now, refresh this. If I click that, well, that, let's, let's make it harder for ourselves. So I'll copy like a few different things. OK, so I've copied all these things. If I click on this, it puts it on our clipboard. So when I do paste, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reaction I was looking for, Tony. Cool. Uh, or if I click this, That's funny. it puts it on the clipboard. So. Oh, I mean, that's not going to take us anywhere. But yeah, it's working. Um, one thing we can do, though, is because you'll notice, like, if I click on these things that are lower in the list, it puts them at the top because it's literally adding them to the clipboard, right? And we're watching the clipboard, so it, it gets added. Um, it might make sense to just, like, move that thing to the um, to the end of the array the moment you click on it so that it's not in there twice because, like, why would you need it twice, right? Right. 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 <laughs> so would that would that be something where we uh, we could check for it like uh, if you click on something and then it equals something else in the array, don't well, copy um, it back. Well, not not exactly because well, one one thing is we already are checking if the last thing in the clipboard was was uh, already in our history, um, but I think what we want to do now is. When you click on it, just put it at the end of the array. So that way, when the the interval checks for that again, it just it won't put it back in there because it's already at the end of the array. So we're basically going to take whatever they click on, take it out of the array, and then put it on the end of the array. Does that help? <laughs> OK. Cool. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think the other thing that is, though, like you did mention we want to show like the time when they clicked on it. So. Let's let's make it a little bit more complex. So instead of just pushing in the text, let's also push in the date whenever they or the like the time whenever they copied that thing. So like instead of pushing just the text, we'll push in an object and we'll say like clipped clipped like that is uh, right now like that. <laughs> Um, and now we have to kind of change what we're text, uh, checking because we'll say uh, this.history.push. We're pushing this object, but now when we're checking to see if it's the text, we want to see if dot text is the text. But now we're going to have an issue. Because <laughs> when the app first starts up, uh, we actually uh, don't have any history in there. So we would be checking dot text of undefined. Let's just do this. When the, um, when the app starts up, we're going to push it in before we set the interval. Trust me on this, Tony, OK? You're trusting me? <laughs> I believe in you. Cool. And now when we write text, we want to do item.text. Cool. OK. Um, now that we have the date right below this, let's just throw in like a small. And we'll say item.clipped. That should show the actual date that it happened. Object, object. Um, nest because this needs to be item dot text. Cool, uh, and we do we do want there to be like a 
the space in between the two. It's probably not the best way to do it, but. Um, this could be just the way, yeah. Uh, let's look at the styles. I think this is something that Bulma is doing because the, well, it could be also because the anchor tag can't necessarily have breaks inside of it. Let's see. Panel block, a lot. Ooh, it's because it's a flex box. Yeah, so the panel block, this thing, is a flex box. If we set a flex direction to be uh, column, yeah, that'll do that. And then we actually don't want to align item center. Like that. You feeling me, Tony? <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, and actually, uh, Jordan, uh, oh, sorry, Chris in the chat saying, write text writes plain text, and write HTML writes markup, but you'd have to read the selection as HTML instead of as text. Yeah, so we'd have to figure out um, what is the type of the thing that just got copied, and if it was HTML, I think, I mean, we could get a lot more complex with this because now inside of our history object, we could also set the type. And then when you paste it, we would set the type there too. We could do the same thing with images, definitely. Um, but let's let's get these styles working. And then what was the thing we were gonna do? Oh, we're gonna make it do an elephant sound yeah. every time. <laughs> elephant sound, yeah. And then I think that would be a good place to end it after we do the elephant sound, okay. Uh, so our panel block class needs the following things. We want um, flex direction to be column, and we want align items to be uh, just flex start, I guess. Hard refresh. Cool, got that. I guess we could also technically bring in like a date formatting library. I don't wanna worry about that. <laughs> um, though, if we create a date, <laughs> there is like a built-in date dot to time string. I don't know. We won't worry about formatting that for now. Let's make it make an elephant sound. Yep. <laughs> What's that, Tony? It look, I was going to say it looks fine. <laughs> it, looks, it looks fine. I'm getting sidetracked. OK. So um, yes, when we push something into the array, let's um, make an elephant sound. So let, first, let's find an elephant sound. Um, if all else fails, you, we could record uh, record you just going like <laughs> or something. I don't think uh, that's how the sound. But no, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn down you just a little bit because I don't know how loud this is gonna be for the viewers. Oh, this costs money. <laughs> okay, that's intense. Um, elephant roar. <laughs> That's interesting note. <laughs> um, in like Jurassic Park, for their like uh, dinosaur sounds, they actually use like sounds of elephants and stuff like that. These do cost money. Technically, we could look at the dev tools and just like download the sound file. But let's let's find a free free soundeffects.com. Tell, uh, tell me, tell me which one you like, Tony. I can't hear any of these. What's that? Oh, you can't hear. Oh, I totally forgot. You can't hear these. Um, oh, I should. Uh, I'll turn the sound on the stream real quick. Okay. 
That one's intense. I think the first one sounds good. It's kind of just silly. Cool. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, and for those of you that have just joined, the idea is it's the clipboard elephant because he never forgets. So, yes, we'll do this one. Let's download this as MP3. And we'll just put it in that directory. Elephant sound mp3. This whole thing is reminding me of uh, there's that episode of the Nigel or the Wild Thornberries where Nigel Thornberry goes to meet like this elephant that he saved like years ago. Hmm. Not, and not, not now familiar. I'm just kind of thinking that we should have had Nigel Thornberry laughing instead. Um. Oh, for <laughs> for as a sound effect. We, we, we may not do this. Yeah, he's just like... <laughs> <laughs> All right, we may not do this, but uh, let's let's see it. Uh, Nigel Thornberry laugh sound. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. No. <laughs> um, that was a weird one anyways. Okay, so we have the MP3 file. What, what I'm thinking, Tony, is we can literally just use browser API to actually play the sound. So um, if we check out MDN docs for audio, you can create an audio thingy. Audio object. Well, I don't see it here, but I know how to do it. Let's see. Syntax. Because we don't want an audio buffer. I believe we can just say new audio and then pass in uh, the path to the audio. So like, check this out. I'm pretty sure we can just do this in DevTools real quick. Um, so if I say audio equals new audio, and then we pass in the path, which is um, elephant sound dot mp3 file not found. Oh, what did I call it? Elephant sounds. No, let's call it elephant sound. Let's try that again. Okay. And then if I do audio dot play. It worked. I don't think you can hear it, Tony, but that worked. So I think that's basically all we got to do. So we will, um, inside of our renderer, like when the app loads up, we will create an audio variable. So right there, just say uh, const audio equals uh, new audio. Uh, do a capital A. Yep. And then invoke it, and then we'll pass in the path to that file. So in single quotes, just do dot slash elephant underscore sound dot mp3. Cool. So we have our audio. And then now, anytime something gets pushed into the history array, we will, uh, do we want to play it anytime it gets pushed into the array or whenever they click on it? Uh, I think every anytime something gets pushed to the array. <laughs> okay, it's gonna be super annoying, but. So that way, that way, you know, it's in the background and you're like, oh, yeah, it's working. <laughs> okay. So right here, we should just be able to do um, audio.play. Um, we, we do, is there a, uh, yeah, so we do want to, in case it had already played, we want to set the current time back to zero and then play the sound. Um, I did a live stream where I made a soundboard and basically we had to do this anytime you clicked it. Okay, Tony, <laughs> moment of truth. Let's copy something. It worked. I don't think you can hear it, Tony, but it worked. So uh, anytime I copy... I heard it in the background. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anytime I copy something, there it is. And if we look, we have multiple things in our copy history. And we can uh, click on them. Yeah, they do get pushed to the front. And then we can like paste them in somewhere if we need access to them. Cool. 
It's pretty great. All right. Um, James did remind me I do need to put a notification sound checkbox because we haven't done that yet. <laughs> so we'll say uh, elephant sound done. All right. I think uh, last thing we'll do is just move move the thing that you click on to the top of the list so it doesn't show up there multiple times. And I think we'll end it there. Um, <laughs> I'm getting a suggestion in the chat. Randomize three types of animal sounds. We could, or we can get like a few different elephant sounds and play a random one. I don't know. Yeah, you could have that, and then and then there'd be like, um, like a recording of just like you or me to be like, I'm an elephant. <laughs> yes. Um, the ran possibilities are endless. Random Tooth Touch is saying remove the clicked item. I think one thing is though, when you click on it, it's technically getting put in your clipboard. So we still want to show it, I think. I think, what the, I think what we'll do is we'll just move it to the end of the array. So that way, it, wherever it was when you clicked on it, it goes back up to the top. So let's do this. So when you click an item, we are writing the text to the clipboard. But before we do that, we basically want to pull it out of the array and then put it into the end. So first, let's get the index of the item. So right here, say uh, const index equals. Uh, this dot history dot index of item. And so invoke it and pass in item. Yeah. So that'll grab the index in the array. Um, and it's important that we do this instead of passing in the index because in the view, we're, we're iterating over history reverse. So the index here is actually different. Let's take a quick stretch. Oh, I see what, so I see what, uh, <laughs> what uh, Random Toots is saying. Um, is uh, when you remove it, it's just going to be added anyways. So uh, it, it should do that automatically. Yeah, and so uh, and also a question from Rodrigo: Is Electron used only to make Windows apps? Uh, no, it's totally cross-platform. So actually, right now I'm developing on um, a Mac, but technically Tony can pull this down to his Windows machine and start it up, and it should work in the very same way. Um, and it's mainly because like the way they've implemented this is the, like this API for a clipboard is cross-platform. So you write your code like this, like write text, and under the hood, they're taking care of the differences between like writing to the clipboard for Windows versus Mac versus Linux. Um, and the other question is the compiled source code protected? Not necessarily, because when you distribute this, you you technically could like minify your JavaScript code, but because it's running a Chromium instance, it's still running your JavaScript code. So you have to actually distribute your JavaScript code with it. I think there are some tools out there to protect your source code and like prevent tampering. Um, but ultimately, um, you are shipping your JavaScript code. And uh, James is asking, Electron should work on Linux, right? Yes, absolutely. So I, I believe like VS Code and Atom, they all have uh, versions that you can run on on Linux or like or Ubuntu. Same thing for like for this app, uh, I'll write the instructions in the README, but you should be able to pull it down, type uh, npm install, and then npm start, and it should work. Should. <laughs> Let me see if I, I missed any other chats. Stretch cycle through ten different elephant sounds. <laughs> We are not going to do that. Um, but yeah, I think what uh, what Random Toots is saying should actually work. So if we just remove this from the array, the moment we uh, copy it should just put it right back into the array. So we have the index. Now we want to remove this index out of the history array. So if we do uh, this dot history dot splice, this is your cue, Tony. Are you still there, Tony? Tony! Yeah, your audio is cutting out. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. <laughs> uh, well, don't create a variable. Just say this.history.splice. And splice takes in the index that you want to remove. So just pass in index. And then the second parameter is how many you want to remove. And we want to remove just one. 
cool. So we remove that out of the array. And then this should work because once we write the text, this function up here will just push it into the end of the array. All right, let's see. Cool, so let's copy a few things. Let's copy that. <laughs> I totally forgot the sound was gonna play. <laughs> Copy that, and that. <laughs> okay, but now we have a history of things. Uh, and for instance, if we click on this, it moved up to the top, and I can paste it in. And if we click on this, that moves up to the top, and uh, I can paste it in. Oh, uh, that sound is hilarious. Uh, we, we maybe as a I'll, I'll add this as a stretch because if anyone else want, out there wants to work on it as well, um, settings to disable or change sound. <laughs> um, were there other other uh, stretch features that people were mentioning? Don't think so. Cool. Um, one, one last thing, one very last thing is when you click an item, let's scroll the window back up to the top. So that way, cause like if I click this, it disappears <laughs> and that sound plays and it actually uh, shows up at the top, but um, let's, let's scroll the window. So that is easy enough. We can just say um, a window dot scroll to and just pass in a uh, zero, zero. And so now anytime you click an item, it'll scroll back up to the top of the window. Um, let's copy this. And we'll, we'll copy that. <laughs> copy that. <laughs> and we'll copy that. Computer science has gone too far. <laughs> okay, so now if we click this, it scrolls back up to the top, and, and we can see that. Awesome. And if we click that, it scrolls back up to the top. Wait, did that work? Yeah, it worked. Cool. Um, cool. And so I'm, I'm getting some good suggestions in the chat. I'm going to add those as stretch features, so if you want to pull this down and work on it. Um, and uh, Chris is asking, is there any action that would reduce the number of items in the array? Um, are you asking, like, should we be limiting how many things you actually push into the array? I mean, we, we probably should, because if you leave this thing running all the time, like, eventually it's going to have, like, a thousand things inside of it. That would probably be a good uh, stretch thing. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna, I'll add these to stretch. Like, you and, could maybe... Uh, go ahead, Tony. Well, I was going to say, like, maybe... I don't know if there's any way to like test it to figure out like how many um, things it could break, but you could just like have a thing at the top, like set number of things to remember. Mm. And then like essentially if it goes past that, it starts disabling it. Or maybe it gives you a notification, like a, a sad elephant like sounds <laughs> and it's like you've reached your max thing. And that'll let you know that it will start deleting the older stuff. Is that making sense? Am I making yeah, definitely. And so I, I think uh, like there, there's definitely an option here to like add in settings. We could add like a little uh, settings button right here, and then you could have settings for um, for one store the history in uh, a local database so that every time you open the app, it stays there. Limit the number of items stored to like a hundred. Um, have some uh, potentially syntax highlighting. So like you could add like detect source code and and highlight the syntax. Um, and so Chris is saying, uh, also, th uh, I guess I'm thinking about this, like I think about undo history. I don't, I don't know exactly what you're saying, Chris, but, but, but basically I think because of the way this thing works, like no matter what we copy, it just gets pushed into the array. <laughs> I want to disable that sound. Um, I don't think there's anything we can do that's gonna change change the contents of the array because it, it basically is just when you click on an item, it pulls it out and puts it back in, and you can access it. So, I think 
uh, yes, so that's that's another awesome feature. So like uh, tagging um, snippets, searching and filtering snippets. Cool. I think I got everything. If if I didn't if I didn't catch your chat, uh, you open an issue on this uh, on this repo, and we'll happy to add it. All right, Tony. Um, let's just do a quick quick review of what we built, and then I think we'll end it there. This was fun. Thanks 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 for joining me today, Tony. <laughs> yeah, man. Definitely. <laughs> you sound sad, Tony. You need some you need some rest. Do you have a long day? Yeah, I'm just yeah I'm just tired. <laughs> like <laughs> like these th like. I have like a full work day and then I, I drive, you know, do my commute and then I come home and it's do this thing and it's like, all right, use your brain. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, everyone at home appreciates you, Tony. Um, because I just saw this, I think I want to fix it. So this thing is like going outside. I think I want to do word wrap. Well, that didn't help. Oh well, stretch feature fix <laughs> fix the CSS bug. Okay. Uh, also, also uh, date formatting. <laughs> Show nicely formatted date. Fix overflow text CSS. Okay. There's there's a lot of things uh, we can do. Uh, so. Ooh, uh, another another suggestion from Random Tuts. I'll add this. What about navigating with arrow keys and then copying them with Enter? Okay. Um, and Chris is asking where we're located. I'm based in the Denver area. Tony is in uh, Columbus, Ohio area. We're actually just on a remote call. And shout out from them all. Tony, you're great. Appreciate the effort on the cast. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's let's review from the beginning. So, main.js is our entry point. This is where we're creating our Electron app, and we're bringing in a browser window from Electron and tray. And these are the two uh, objects provided by Electron that actually allow us to do these native things. And so, um, we have access to various events. So, like uh, when the app becomes active, is actually when we create the window. And inside of create window is where we'll create our browser window. Uh, we're setting frame false so that you actually don't see like the default window Chrome with like the X's and icons and stuff like that. Um, we're immediately hiding the window after creating it because we only want the window to show whenever we click on the icon. And then we created a tray icon. And in this icon directory, um, in their documentation, they talk about you can specify different sizes of icons. So depending on the DPI of the screen, it'll choose the appropriate icon. I don't know how to test if this is working. It it does actually look like this is pretty pixelated up here. But you can look in their docs to see about that. So that sets the icon there. Uh, and then we have a click handler on the tray. So when you click on the tray, if the window was not visible, let's show it. If it was visible, let's hide it. And then whenever we uh, show the window, we actually want to set the position of the window to be the bounds of the tray. And actually, while we're here, I want to fix this because on a Mac, this works. But someone using a Windows computer that were to click the, like the tray icon in the bottom right, this wouldn't work because we actually want to set um, the x, x direction is, is right. But in this case, we actually want to do, um, like, if y is 0, set it to 0. Because on a Mac, y is going to be 0 because it's up at the top. I'm just going to write this co code real quick. So if bounds.y is equal to 0, then 0. Otherwise, the y location is actually going to be um, bounds.y minus the height of the window. Uh, main window dot height. And then we'll just pass in y there. 
Hope that makes sense. And um, I think if you um, if you pull this down and run it on like Ubuntu or Windows, we might have to actually tweak this to make sure that it shows up in the right place depending on what platform that you're on. Um, I guess the other thing is whenever we hide the window, we remove this highlight over the icon. You'll notice the icon is like highlighted blue, but then when it goes away, it disappears. And the main window is loading our index.html where all of our, our stuff is inside of. Uh, I'm also gonna comment out this line uh, so that the dev tools don't open up automatically. You can uncomment this line to open them up automatically. And then if we look in our index.html, we're bringing in uh, Bulma, which we just installed from uh, node modules. Let's set the title here too. Uh, we have some styles that we defined, and then we just have a basic template to use with our Vue.js app. And then this file is requiring a renderer, uh, which is a JavaScript file that has access to node modules, but it also has access to Chromium to actually manipulate the DOM. So if we look in renderer, this is where we're bringing in clipboard from Electron, we're bringing in Vue, and then we're creating our Vue instance. Catch up on the chat. Oh, cool. Uh, and um, a question from Amal, did I discuss what types or examples of packages would go under dev dependencies for Electron development? Um, I didn't. Um, and I, I think the thing is, yeah. Yeah, so probably uh, things like linting, testing, those would go under de dev dependencies, similar to like other front end projects that you've worked on. Um, things that you're using in the app definitely need to be under dependencies. Like we need access to Vue, we need access to uh, Bulma. So those are gonna be listed under our just regular uh, dependencies. Um, and here it's saying Electron is a dev dependency, but that's probably because uh, whenever you actually build it, you don't need to install Electron because it gets built with the binaries. Um, and that's one thing we didn't talk about on the stream is to how, how to actually distribute this app. There is uh, the, I think it might say it in the readme. Let's see. Not that readme, this readme. Um, I think it might be like Electron Builder or something like that, but th there is another package out there that you can bring in that allows you to distribute your app for Linux or Windows or Mac and actually creates a, like a binary that you can install on those, on those systems. Cool. And then Quick review of how the uh, Vue.js app is working. So we're just keeping track of an array of all the things that you've copied. And um, looking at the docs, it didn't seem like Clipboard had any way of telling us if there was anything new added to the Clipboard. So we kind of, I don't know if this is hacky or not, I don't know if there's a better way to do it, but basically every 500 milliseconds, we're just checking to see if something new is on the Clipboard. And if it is, we're pushing it that into our our history, and we're, we're checking to make sure that we haven't already pushed it in. And then we're also playing that that audio clip. <laughs> Daniel, welcome to the stream, hello. We're almost done, but it's good to see you. <laughs> and um, and then we also have, like, once you've clicked an item in your history, we pull that out and put it at the beginning of the array, <laughs> play that sound, and now that's on your clipboard, so you can go and paste it in somewhere if you need to. And uh, the template for this is pretty simple. We're basically just doing a V4 over history and history reversed is a computed property. So basically we're just taking that array, reversing it so that the most recent thing copied is at the top of the list. And then in here, we just create this element for everything in your history. And it's pretty much it. Um, in the readme, I do have like lots of things you could potentially do as uh, stretch features. like. Electron does have an API where you can show native desktop no notifications. So like the, um, I think it's called like Growl on OS X or something like that. You can literally show like a native notification that like something was copied to the clipboard. Um, we can build it so that we can distribute it. Uh, NeedDB is a local, <laughs> <laughs> I just copied, so it played the sound. Um, a, it's a local, embedded database. So the idea is like right now this app could run totally offline. Like we don't, we don't need a, a backend or to connect to a server or anything like that. It might be interesting to create a feature where these are like stored in the cloud and then you could have this app on multiple computers and then when you log in you get access to your clipboard from other computers. That actually sounds pretty awesome. That, that's totally doable. But 
if you wanted to like close the app and open it back up and have a history inside of there, you could use something like NeedDB. It has a, a Mongo-like syntax, but it just stores everything in a flat file. So wherever your app is living, you could store your history in that file, and then when the app spins up, you could pull it out of that flat file database. Um, right now, we're only handling text, so there's potential to handle like different data types, like images and like HTML content. Um, we could add settings so you could disable the sound. And I had some nice styles in there. Add syntax highlighting if you're copying code. Uh, have some sort of setting for the max number of things in your history. Tag your snippets so that in the future you can like search or filter them. Format the date better. There's lots of cool stuff that we could add. <laughs> um, and so Chris is asking, could you monitor the keyboard for uh, Command C and push when that happens? I actually tried this earlier, um, and from what I found, no. So there, uh, you actually do have access in Electron to uh, global, yeah, global shortcuts, <clears throat> where you can you can register a shortcut so your app will listen for the shortcut and do something. But when I tested this out earlier with Command C, it actually took control of that and then didn't do the actual copy. Um, so that's a that's a tricky thing. <laughs> and then and the other thing is like so if I press command C right now <laughs> there was a sound. <laughs> it copied it. But the other thing is people might actually copy it using uh like a, a context menu. <laughs> and so you need to check it then. There probably are some tricky things we could do in there. I think that's what Chris is mentioning. So when there is a right click check to see if something is highlighted and then push that in. They're all potential options. Like right now, it's like the brute force way of literally just checking every 500 milliseconds to see if there's something new. <laughs> cool, and Rodrigo is asking, is there a possibility to cut an image clipboard section and save using a rectangle on the screen? Um, I think there might actually be a Electron app out there that does that, but it's totally possible. Um, and that might might be similar to like on a Mac, you can actually take screenshots and like do this, and then they get saved to your desktop. Uh, but you could build an Electron app that takes screenshots and then maybe like stores them in the cloud or something like that. I don't know. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> that, yeah, that's a totally another app. Uh, this was super fun. Um, I'm I'm very excited about what we built. I will push it up to GitHub. You can see in the Description below, the link to the repo. Right now it just has our readme, but I'm about to push up all the code so you can hack on it if you want to. Any last words, comments, criticisms, things you want to say, Tony, before we end the stream? Um, not really, I'm pretty happy with what we made. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Nice little desktop app. It's got a little menu there. You can keep track of your clipboard history. It's pretty cool. <laughs> all right. Um, housekeeping things uh if you're new to the stream if you check out my youtube channel you can see my um upcoming streams tomorrow night is uh, wednesday night and every wednesday night i do i stream myself solving code katas so um if you're not familiar codewars.com um, is a place where you can practice coding and practice uh, solving JavaScript and other languages too, uh, basically solving programming problems. And so every Wednesday I'll pick out like five or six different ones and uh, solve them live on stream and solve them in multiple different ways. And then on Thursday, I am gonna be doing a stream on building a full stack Reddit clone with Firebase Firestore and uh, Vue.js. So tune in for that. And Chris says, this was cool. Rock on, Tony. Rock on. Um, if you do check uh, rock on. Rock on. <laughs> uh, coding.garden, you can see my full streaming schedule. I do need to update it, though. I've started streaming uh, Thursday morning teas at 1030 instead of 945. And then Newbie Tuesdays are at 320 Mountain Time instead of 220. So I'll update that. But you can't see upcoming streams there. Awesome. This was great. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks to everyone for participating in the chat. Um, thanks, Tony, for being a trooper. Like, this is a legit app. Like, you're a new, but we're making we're making quality stuff here. Nothing to say to that, Tony. <laughs> Are you gonna go take a nap right now? No, I, 
I think I'm going to go make some dinner and wash dishes. Okay, sounds like a fun time. Awesome. Do some productive <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah, super fun. <laughs> cool. Before we go, um, I will post the fish cam. I, oh, actually, I don't... Th maybe I didn't post the GitHub link. GitHub link will be in the description soon, and I'll also tweet it out. So if you uh, follow me on Twitter, um, I tweet every time before I go live, and I'll tweet links to code and stuff like that, too. Ram, thanks for tuning in. Amal, thanks. Chris, Rodrigo, everyone else. Um, let's see the fish cam before we go. Ah, he's he's over in by the heater on the left hand side. Come out, fishy! Come on, buddy. Dash. All right, that's all you get of the fishy. <laughs> Are you familiar with uh, Fish Center at all? The Adult Swim thing? Uh no. What is that? Oh, is it like live streaming fish? It's like. Yeah, like it's like this whole uh, video cast thing they do, and they have like fish in a tank, and there's like, I think there's backstories behind all the fish, and then like they even have stuff on screen sometimes where like the fish, if they hit like a coin, it's like a game or something. <laughs> okay, cool. Is he about to come out? There he is. Come on out, buddy. Oh no, he's going in the opposite direction. Oh well. All right. Thanks again. Thanks everyone for watching. This has been super fun. Thank you, Tony, for tuning in. Oh, and, and coding and helping out. And I will see you all tomorrow for Code Goddess. Goodbye. Here's this.